in this session, I will look into the parameters that we need for project identification. What has to be included in the charter? How do we evaluate the information? And how do we deal with international projects and different languages? The things to incorporate in the charter are, first of all, the name and the description of the project. The name should not say anything about the project. We all know the Manhattan Project. We also know it has nothing to do with Manhattan. It was the creation of the first nuclear weapon in the United States. Manhattan does not give any information about that project. Projects have to be defined in a way that a need is realized. Defining the need that the project will solve is very important. In order to describe those needs, we have to say what the project is about, why do we have to do this project, who will be benefit from the project, by when will it be completed, and how much will it cost. Projects are also defined in business cases or statements of work. These are also parts that have to be used when we create the charter. We have to add information about the client or clients, the sponsor and the project manager. Reference documents like regulations, norms and standards may be important for your specific projects and these elements have to be incorporated in the charter. Let's have a look at evaluating the information that we obtain when we are defining a project. Like I said before, business cases and statements of work provide the basic information for the project. Sometimes we are confronted with old projects, perhaps old business cases. So the first thing to evaluate is the value of that information. Is it still relevant? We may have to rework the business case. We may have to rewrite the charter. But at least before we continue, we have to be sure that whatever is written in the business case or the charter is still relevant. In some cases, there is still some money left. Hey, sir, we still have some money left. Let's do the project Titanic. It may happen in some organizations that budgets have to be spent at the end of the fiscal year or the calendar year. In that case, not doing a project would mean losing the money. But do we have to do all the project just to spend the money? When I was in a military construction agency, I was doing a project where we had to replace a pre-constrained beam that was relaxing. It lost its strength, had to be supported in order to keep the integrity of the building. We define the project to take out the beam and replace it by a new beam, a stable beam, and resolve the problem forever. As the end of the year came, our colonel had to meet the general about the final budgets for the year. A colonel wants to make the general happy to get a new promotion. And when the general announced that he still had some money left, he was looking for voluntary people to spend that money. My colonel said, yes, yes, sir, I have some project. I can spend it. It's no problem. 
So the happy colonel came back and gave the word to me, his lieutenant. When I looked at the project, I verified the situation of the building and my conclusion was that the remaining 11 beams were still in good condition and replacing them would be a waste of time and money. So I went back to my colonel and I said, sir, this project is not good. It's not necessary to replace the beams. And he said, we have to spend the money. You have to do it. And my answer was, yet I will not do it. We can spend the money on some other projects, but not on this one. So finally, we found some other projects and the money got spent and everybody was happy. You can imagine it's not easy for a young lieutenant to say no to a colonel. But anyway, as a project manager, you have to find the best way to spend the money for your company and your organization. Wasting money, even one crown, one dollar, one euro, is not always an option. Another problem that project managers tend to have is missing input. You get the information, but the most important part or essential parts are missing. How do you get that information? Nobody answers, nobody replies to your emails. What do you do? Well, you fill it out yourself. You say, I didn't get any information, but I think this should be relevant. Please agree with it. I assure you, within the hour, you will have a reaction back with the correct information. Value of the input is also very important. Input does not always mean good input. Projects also follow the rule of garbage in, garbage out. Who gives you the input? How stable is the input? Is it changing all the time or you have it and it's okay, it's not changing? It depends. The input that you receive, it's, is it relevant? You may get a lot of information, but none of it may be relative or relevant for your project. In many cases, project managers encounter customers who do not know what they want. For that type of project, Agile is ideal. You can make a contract and you find out all the customer needs on the go. When you look at all the elements we discussed in this one slide, there is one golden rule to be applied by the project manager, and that is to be proactive. Be proactive and assertive. Get the information from the people that can give you the information. Don't sit and wait. Go for it. Make your problem, make your project a success. Today we may be working in local projects, but many projects are international. And when we work with international projects, mostly the language used in the project is English. You will also see that most of the people who are working in the project are not native speakers. They may not understand the English in the same way as a native speaker does, or even people with other languages as main languages may interpret the words differently. In order to resolve this, you can create a project dictionary. A dictionary which states clearly what every word that you are using in the project means and 
including abbreviations that you are using either in your company or in your project. It is very important to define abbreviations in a way that they only have one meaning. Unfortunately, even in the PIMBOK, even in the Project Management Institute, there may be some confusing abbreviations. For example, present value, PV, can also mean planned value. Earned value can also be used as expected value. So there is some confusion and you have to understand the context. I was talking with one of my colleagues in AT&T about abbreviations and the abbreviation was FTE, typically representing a full-time equivalent. But the text in which the FTE abbreviation was used made it difficult to understand why would people talk about telephone lines and full-time equivalents. In the context of the document, FTE did not mean full-time equivalent, but field terminating equipment. It's a completely different word, different meaning, but it can be confusing because the same abbreviations are used for different terms. Even just using English can lead to confusion. What's a perambulator? The trunk or the booth? Tomato or tomato? There are more versions of English that you can select in Windows applications. Spanish, I think, even have 26 variants all kinds of differences that may lead to confusion. So in your project, since you're operating between different companies and different organizations, it may be useful to make a project dictionary. PMI already provides a very large list of definitions and abbreviations that can be used, but like I said, we still have to be careful because some abbreviations may have double meanings. So, we are ready to go to the next session. Let's take a short break. You've been, you have been doing a good job. See you in the next session.